رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله uh, الحمد لله It's great to, to be back here at uh, Medina Masjid I've been here a number of times before um, and it's a very blessed uh, place to come and visit MashaAllah a great community, great Imam MashaAllah uh, very hospitable, very welcoming. Um, so, as I said, it's always nice to come back here. Um, so, the, the topic of this kind of tour that's been organized, and there's been different speakers going to different masajid around Manchester, uh, Oldham, Rochdale, etc. And the idea behind it was that we're in the month of the Quran. We're in the month of Ramadan. The month of Ramadan is the month of the Quran. Um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In the ayat where he talks about fasting in Surah Al-Baqarah, the first thing he says about the month of Ramadan is what? He says, شهر رمضان الذي أنزل فيه القرآن That the month of Ramadan is the month in which the Qur'an was revealed. So the first thing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions about this month is not that it's a month of fasting. It's not that it's a month of dua. It's not that it's a month of traweeh. Uh, the first thing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions about this month is that it's the month of the Qur'an. Yeah, so it's a month in which we come back to the Qur'an. Of course, we know that the Qur'an was revealed when? In which night? You can tell me. What night was the Qur'an, Quran revealed? In Laylatul Qadr. Yes. Inna anzalnahu fi Laylatul Qadr. That indeed we revealed it, i.e. the Qur'an, in, uh, on the night of power. Laylatul Qadr. And Laylatul Qadr, when is Laylatul Who can tell me when Laylatul Qadr is? Last 10 days. It's in Ramadan, yes. In the last 10 days. Which which night in the last 10 days? 22 to 30. 22 to 30. 22? 20 and 30. 20 to 30, odd nights. Yes. Before to 30. Any day. Any day. Any, uh, like, uh, um, 21, 23, 27. Oh, any of the odd nights in the last 10 okay. So not, not, not definitely 27th, no? Yes, not. So you find that I mean, people have already said it's 27th. Everywhere you go, they say, no, it could be any of the last 10 nights, but you go to any masjid and you see the 27th night is, is the night. And the 21st isn't like the 27th. So we made up in our mind that it's the 27th. And there's a reason behind this is a statement of Ubay ibn Ka'b. Uh, in which he said it was the 27th, but that's a statement of a companion. We also have other narrations um, that mention uh, different nights. Sorry, just a quick question for you. You know, when you say the Quran is revealed on, in, on the 20th, on Laylat al Qadr, what part of the, or was it just a small part of the Very good question. Yeah. yeah, so what does that actually mean? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in another verse, he says, Inna fi mubarakah, that we reviewed it on a blessed night. Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhuma, Ibn Abbas is the great. Uh, Mufassir of the Qur'an, he's known as Turjuman al-Qur'an, the one who was the greatest scholar of the Qur'an. He said what is meant by this is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he revealed the Qur'an yani, from, uh, from Allah al-Mahfuz, the preserved tablet, which is with Allah. He revealed it from the preserved tablet to Bayt al-Izza, which is in the first heaven. And he did this in one go on the night of power, on Laylatul Qadr, yes, in the month of Ramadan. And then, of course, Jibreel would come down with revelation over the course of 23 years. Over the course of 23 years, then, the Qur'an was then revealed according to situations, according to things that happened, etc. And that happened over a period of 23 years. But it came down on this first, the first revelation came down on, in Laylatul Qadr. And as you all said, Laylatul Qadr, we don't know when it is. It's one of the last 10 nights. The Prophet Ali, salatu was salam. And this is why you see from the Sunnah is what? Is the Prophet Sallallahu would do itikaf. He would perform itikaf to seclude himself for the whole ten nights. And Aisha radiallahu anha, she said that the Prophet would increase his ibadah in these last ten nights. Seeking Laylatul Qadr. And, and, and this is why the opinion of many of the scholars is that it actually changes every, every year. It could be any one of these last ten nights, but it changes every year. So you don't know when it is. The point being what is that you seek to, to, to strive to try to find uh, Laylatul Qadr and, and you know, worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, of course throughout these last 10 nights. But coming back to the point that the Qur'an, of course, is revealed in this month. It's a month in which we should regain um, our relationship with the Qur'an, revise the Qur'an, read the Qur'an, try to reflect on the Qur'an, contemplate on the Qur'an. 
Uh, this is the month of Quran. This is the month of revelation. Uh, even when you come for the Taraweeh, in the Taraweeh, what are we doing? We're standing in prayer, listening to what? Listening to the Quran. Yes, it's all about Quran. But the Quran, of course, wasn't revealed just to be recited. Yes, the Quran was revealed to be understood, to be uh, reflected upon, to be acted upon. This is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Shahr Ramadan, Allah yunzil fihi al Quran. What comes next? Hudan nas as a guidance for mankind. So the whole purpose of this book that we have, the Quran, is that it's a book of guidance. It's a book that we, when we have issues in our life, when we want guidance on how we should be as uh, in, our, in our family life, in our businesses, um, whatever it may be, you have a guide there to go by. Yes, when it comes to you face situations in your life, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala narrates us the stories of all of these different prophets. Yeah, all of them have gone through something that we've gone through. And you have an example there uh, to follow. So the book, the Quran is actually a book of guidance. It's a book of um, connecting with and trying to understand and reflecting upon. And, and this is why one of my teachers, he said that the Prophet ﷺ didn't come to teach the companions how to uh, recite the Quran. And he came, of course, that was one of his missions, يَتْلُوا عَلَيْهِمْ آيَاتِهِ But not, that wasn't his, his overall mission. And he said that his overall mission was what? Was to teach the companions how to live the Quran, how to live by this book. And I'm going to base my life on this Qur'an. And that can only come with understanding. Now, for many of us, we will read the Qur'an and we won't understand what we're reading. Is the, is, should we do this? Yes. Because there's barakah in the recitation of the Qur'an. The man min kitabillahi falahu hasana. The Prophet said that whoever recites one letter from the book of Allah will get a hasana. And a hasana is like ten. And so for one letter, you get ten rewards. Imagine the barakah, the rewards the ajr that you get in reciting the Qur'an. Okay, so there's definitely we should recite the Qur'an. But we also have to have, when it comes to our relationship with the Qur'an, a portion of understanding what we're reciting. And yes, so that means reading the translation, reading the tafsir, in whichever language you understand. That's yes, whether it's Urdu, there's many tafsirs in Urdu. Yeah, whether it's English, you have uh, Ibn Kathir in English, you have the uh, tafsir Jalaleen in English, you have many of these different tafsirs now in English that you can read. Uh, and try to understand the, the message of the Qur'an. So we have to have a portion when it comes to our um, relationship with the Qur'an, we have to have a portion of uh, reflecting and understanding and reading to, to, to try to live by the message of the Qur'an. Because that's when the Qur'an will transform you. Yes, the Qur'an will transform you when you truly understand it and try to live by it. Yes, if you're just reciting, like I said, you'll get great ajr and great reward. But will it have that transformative effect? Um, will, it, will it change your conduct and your behavior? Not to the extent it would if you understood what you're reading. Yeah, so that's, any, I think, the main kind of point I want to mention with regards to this. Now, when we're doing these tours, the truth is we've been to different massages and different speakers have been giving reflections from different stories in the Quran. And uh, yesterday I was in the Masjid in Chita Mil and I gave it on the story of Adam alayhi salam. Um, and some reflections from, from the first story we find in the Qur'an. But today I, I thought I'd, I'd change it up and do something a bit different. Um, and I'll give you a story from uh, the Hadith. Okay, and this is, the reason I want to do this is because there's young people here. And uh, it's a very inspirational story. Okay, and I think it's a story that many, I think the majority of you haven't heard before. The story of Adam alayhi salam you've heard, the story of Musa alayhi salam you've heard, the story of Yusuf alayhi salam you've heard. But this story I believe you've not heard. And this is a hadith narrated in Hakim. And of course, hadith is also wahi. Yes, so when we talk about revelation, we talk about the Quran and the Sunnah. Okay? So this uh, hadith is, is reported by Imam Hakim. And it's a story of uh, the old woman from Bani Israel. Yeah, anyone heard this story? Which one? You'll find out now. <laughs> Yeah, the story of the old woman from Bani Israel. Of course, we don't know her name. But her story is what? The Prophet ﷺ, he once visited a villager. And uh, this villager was very welcoming to the Prophet ﷺ. Okay, so welcomed the Prophet ﷺ in. The Prophet ﷺ had the companions, was very generous to the Prophet ﷺ. And the Prophet ﷺ was very happy with the way that he was um, greeted by this, this villager. So he said to the villager, he said, the next time you're in Medina, come and visit me. Yes, the Prophet said, the next time you're in Medina, come and visit me. 
So the villager said, fine, a bit of time passed by, he came and visited Medina and then he went to the Prophet The Prophet was very generous towards this visitor that he had received, his guest. Um, and then when, once they had finished, the villager, the, the Bedouin, he was making his way. And the Prophet ﷺ said to him that, Sal Hajjata, that ask, is there anything that you want? Okay, is there anything that you, you want or anything that you need? And the villager, he was a simple man, he responded, he said, I want a camel and some sheep. A camel that I can ride and some sheep that will give milk for my family. Very simple request. I mean, this is the Prophet ﷺ, and you could ask for anything and he'll make dua for Allah for it. And he asked for a, a camel and some sheep. So the Prophet ﷺ, he said, if only, or was it not possible, that he uh, could ask, like the old woman of Bani Israel, or like the old woman of Bani Israel, asked Musa alayhi salam. I.e., he should have asked, like the old woman of Bani Israel, asked Musa alayhi salam. So, of course, the companions uh, sat there, and what do you think their question is? What did she ask? Ah, what did she ask? And what is it that who is this old woman of Bani Israel? What did she ask Musa alayhi salam for? Then the Prophet alayhi salatu salam went on to do, to explain the story of this old woman. So the Prophet والسلام, he said that when Musa والسلام, decided to uh, migrate, decided to uh, leave uh, Egypt, um, whilst they were on their way, in some narrations it mentions it was the night time, they got lost. Okay, so they got lost, they didn't know where they were going. And some of the, the, the scholars that were accompanying Musa والسلام, they said perhaps the reason we got lost is because when Yusuf السلام, was about to pass away, he said to his descendants that if you are ever to leave Egypt, make sure you take my body with you. Okay? Make sure you take my body with you, if you're ever to leave Egypt. And they said, perhaps we never took, we never fulfilled this promise that was made to Yusuf السلام, and this is why we're lost. Okay? So Musa السلام, said what? He said, fine. He said, where is the grave of Yusuf السلام? Where, did, where can we find the body of Yusuf alayhi salam? They said, nobody knows it apart from the old woman from Bani, from Bani Israel. Nobody knows where the, the grave is apart from an old woman from Bani Israel. So Musa, Musa alayhi salam says, fine, call this old woman from Bani Israel. So they eventually find the old woman, they bring the old woman to, to Musa alayhi salam. Musa alayhi salam says that where is uh, the grave of Yusuf alayhi salam? She says, I will not tell you Unless you guarantee me one thing. Okay, I'm not going to tell you. Unless you guarantee me one thing. Okay? So Musa salam says, okay, what's this one thing? She said, Murafaqataka fil Jannah. I want your companionship in Jannah. I want to be with you in Jannah. Yes, this is a request of the old woman from Bani Israel. Musa salam, he didn't like that request. Why? Because it's not up to him who's with him in Jannah. So he's like, I'm asking you where the grave is and you're not asking me for companionship in Jannah, you know. But then, of course, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala inspired Musa alayhi salam to accept this request. Okay, so Musa alayhi salam then accepted the request. Then the old woman from Bani Israel, she said, okay, go to this area, there's a pond there, empty the water and then dig and you'll find the, uh, the, the body of Musa alayhi salam, uh, of Yusuf alayhi salam. They did this, they emptied the water, they did, they, they, dig and then they uh, find the uh, bones of Yusuf alayhi salam and then the hadith ends okay so that's the hadith that's the story of the old woman from Bani Israel now of course why was the Prophet sallallahu telling this telling us this story why did he narrate this story to us um, because of course there are many lessons that you can learn from this story yes the reason why he said when, when that simple villager asked him that you know all I want is a she camel and I want some sheep and he's saying, you know, if only you'd ask like the woman from the old woman from Bani Israel asked, meaning what? Is that she's an example to follow when it comes to what you want, what you request, what you're seeking. Uh, so the Prophet didn't really like this simple request that was made to him by the, the villager. Uh, so just a few reflections. Okay, the first one is that you know when it comes to um, the iman, the faith of our elderly. There's something special in, you know, when it comes to our practicing elderly, those who are praying, those who have a ta'alaq with the Qur'an and the masjid and salah, etc. 
you find a special any sweetness in their relationship with Allah that many of our youngsters or many of my generation or the younger generation doesn't have. And as you will see, and even in our masjid, our, uh, our, the Imam Shaykh Abdul Ghaffar, he always says that after the salah, when I turn around and I do tasbih, he says, all of the youngsters stand up and leave. The only ones staying behind and doing adhkar and dua are the elders. Yes, because there's something special in their relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Many of them are simple. Maybe even when it comes to their knowledge, they're simple. But when it comes to their ibadah and their sunnah and their nawafil and their Qur'an, they are examples for you and I. Yes, they are examples for you and I. So we should never look down upon our elderly. Sometimes I know in, in, in our generation, in the younger generation, they think that our elderly know nothing. It's these elderly that their relationship with Allah is something that we can really um, take some inspiration from. Um, the second lesson you learn from this story is what? is that look how the Prophet ﷺ, he um, showed goodness and kindness to the one who showed goodness and kindness to him. You know, when the Prophet ﷺ was invited by this villager, this Bedouin, he went and he was treated very well. It mentions in the hadith that he was honored. So the Prophet ﷺ said to that person, when you come to Medina, I'm going to give you the same honor. Yes, and this is an important lesson for us, the, 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 the reciprocating good with good. Uh, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, that is the reward for good, anything but good. Of course, when somebody does good to you, then we should always reciprocate that good. We should always um, do good back. And of course, we, we also learn that the Prophet ﷺ, his generosity, yes, for how he would honor the guest. And we know that in many hadith, the Prophet ﷺ talked about the value of the guest. Yes, when you have a guest, giving them the best from what you have. Imam Ghazali, he talks about how when the Prophet ﷺ would have a guest, how he would, you know, give him his seat, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. He would put his cloak out so the person can sit on it. The Prophet ﷺ would give him the best of what he had. And the Prophet ﷺ didn't have much. But he would give the best from what he had. He would really honor the guest. Yes, and that's something that's forgotten today. Again, in our elder generation, you find that. I remember when I was young, you know, it was, it was common for people to be coming and going. And, and, you know, guests from coming from different cities and all of this. And, and our parents and grandparents' generation were very open. They wanted guests to come. That's yes, because they know with these guests there's barakah, there's rahmah. Nowadays people don't want guests. Younger generation, you know, you want to go visit a younger person, they'll say, I'm busy. Yeah? I'll meet you somewhere else. I'll meet you for a kebab. Yeah, don't come to my house. And this is, this is wrong. Yeah, any, one of our, as I said, one of our uh, principles in our deen is generosity and welcoming guests and, and honoring guests. And this is what the Prophet Sallallahu would do. Um, Another point we, we learn, another lesson that we can take is, um, is how this old woman, what was her concern? You know, her concern was what was the akhirah. Her concern was the afterlife. You know, she could have asked for anything. Like the Bedouin, he asked her, he said he wants an, an, an easier life, so he's asking for a camel and some sheep. She could have asked for the same. But no, she asked for what? For Jannah. And she asked for the companionship of the Prophet Musa salam, in Jannah. So we should reflect any what are our du'as focused on. When we ask uh, from Allah, what is it that we actually ask for? What do our du'as comprise of? Um, is it related to the dunya or do we ask for the akhirah? And that's something that we can all individually reflect on. And when I make my du'a to Allah, what is it exactly that I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for? Is it just become a routine where I just say the same thing over and over again? Or do I actually engage in the du'a? Am I thinking about the du'a? Which leads us on to the, the final point that I'll mention. And that's, you know, when you, anything when it comes to our deen, we see that the Prophet ﷺ would always encourage us to go for the best. Yes, it's known as ulu al himma Yani, striving for the best. He said that when you do an action, uh, then do it in the best of ways. Ihsan, itqan, these are principles in our faith. Perfection, excellence, always striving for, for the best in everything that you can do. And this is especially important for our young people that don't just be satisfied with, with you know, uh, a mediocre level. Always, whatever it is you do, you aim for the best. You, you strive for the best. This woman, she didn't just ask, well, let me just get into Jannah. No, I want your companionship in Jannah. The companionship of what? Of the Anbiya. You're going to be in the highest level of Jannah. And similarly, when we ask for Jannah, what do we say? Well, May Allah give us Jannah. No, the Prophet said that when you ask for Jannah, ask for Al-Firdaus. Don't just be satisfied with Jannah, ask for the highest level of Jannah. 
So it's, it's teaching us what? Psychologically, a, a mindset that anything that you do, you ask for the best. You strive for the best. Um, when uh, there was a young boy, yeah, he was maybe you know, 11, 12, early teens, young boy. Uh, at the time of the Prophet ﷺ, his name was Rabi'ah. Rabi'ah, he would always um, station himself outside of the, the home of the Prophet ﷺ. And whenever the Prophet ﷺ would come out, he would always ask the Prophet ﷺ, do you need anything? Any in khidmah of the Prophet ﷺ. Now think about this, he's a young boy. And one day he gets some water for the Prophet ﷺ to perform wudu with. And then the Prophet ﷺ, he said, Sam, the ass, yeah, what is it that you want? Is there anything that you want? Now look at this young boy. He said, As'aluka murafaqataka fil jannah. The same thing that this, this uh, old woman from Bani Israel asked. He said to the Prophet I, I ask you for your companionship in Jannah. And the Prophet ﷺ said, غَيْرَ ذلك, Anything else? Is that all you're asking me for? And in my companionship in Jannah, is there anything else you want? He said, nothing else. This young boy, and he's thinking about the young boy there, 11, 12, 13 years old, and he's thinking about, I want to be with you in Jannah. He's thinking about the Akhirah. He's thinking about the best station in Jannah. And then, and I'll just, yeah, the, the ending of the Hadith is very interesting. Because the Prophet said to the young boy, he said, فَعِمْنِي عَلَى ذَلِكْ بِكَثْرَةِ السُّجُودِ He said, help me achieve this for you. By what? By performing plenty of sujood. I.e. By, by connecting yourself with the Salah. And he helped me achieve this. Achieve this, i.e. having you with me in Jannah. And he helped me achieve this for you by you doing your bit. And what's your bit? By clinging to the Salah. Making sure you're performing plenty of sujood. Yes, making sure that you're consistent in your salah. If you're consistent in your salah, you'll be with me in Jannah. And that's what the Prophet is telling this young boy. He is encouraging it. This again te teaches us how the Prophet will teach the youngsters. So, you know, these are, of course, uh, certain lessons that we learn. And, and I'll just end on this. I know I don't want to take too long. But um, there's this final point of, of always striving for the best, always looking for, for opportunities to do good. Um, never being satisfied with, with the level that you're at. This is something that the Prophet is always teaching us. So always look for those opportunities. You know, when we look at the life of Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, Abu Bakr radiallahu what, anhu, what, what was so special about him that allowed him to achieve the station that he achieved? You know, what was special about him is that he was somebody who was always looking for khair. You know, when the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam, one day, he turns around after the salam, he asks the companions, that who from amongst you today is fasting? And the companions are all sat there. Abu Bakr puts his hand up his eye. He says, who from amongst you today has visited a sick person? Abu Bakr says, I have. <laughs> who from amongst you today has followed a janazah? Abu Bakr says, I have. Who from amongst you today has fed a poor person? Abu Bakr says, I have. And the companions are all looking. And every question is being answered. Abu Bakr, Abu Bakr, he's putting his hand up. And the rest are thinking, maybe they put their hand up for one, maybe for two. Abu Bakr is putting his hand up for everything. And it shows us what? When the Prophet said that there's no person who, all of these good deeds are uh, you know, gathered in this one person, except that this is a person from Jannah. Anyway, because this person is always looking for any chance to do good, any opportunity to, to do good. One day when the Prophet ﷺ was talking about the different doors to Jannah, he said that those people who fasted will go from the, the door of fasting. Those people who used to give sadaqah will go from the door of sadaqah. Those people who used to perform jihad will go from the door of jihad. Those people who used to perform salah will go from the door of salah. Abu Bakr, what does he ask? He doesn't want to just go through one door. He says, is there anybody who will be able to go through all of these doors? And how do I get to, to go through, to, to be able to choose which door I can go through? And the Prophet said, yes. And yeah, I hope Abu Bakr, you're one of them. That can go through all of these different doors. But it teaches us what? Mindset. Yes, always looking to, to, to strive for, for the best. And I'll finish on this one narration when the Prophet ﷺ was talking to the companions one day. And he said that um, there will be 70,000 uh, 70, from my ummah who will go to Jannah without hisab. Okay, 70,000. And the companions are sat there. One companion, he stands up straight away. And he says to the Prophet ﷺ, Udullaha ala kun minhum. That make the to Allah that I'm from these 70,000. Straight away he jumps up. Yes. And now of course the other companions are thinking, yeah, we want to get this as well. So because the Prophet said, inshallah you're from them. 
They made dua that yes, that you're from them. And then the other companions then stand up. They say, they say the same thing. Make dua to Allah that I'm also from them, 70,000. And what did the Prophet say? He said, Sabaqaka biha ukasha. He said, Ukasha beat you to it. Any Ukasha beat you to it. The companion, the first one who stood up, he beat you to it. Meaning what? Is that whenever there's that opportunity, stand up. Don't wait around. And he take the opportunity. Always try to be the first. And that's what we learn from Ukasha. It's what we learn from Abu Bakr. This is what we learn from even the story of the, the, the old woman from Bani Israel. That always going for the best, always striving for excellence. So these are just some of the uh, reflections from this short story. As I said, I don't want to take too long, inshallah. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this blessed month of Ramadan that He gives us tawfiq, that He allows us to strive um, to, to achieve uh, the best that we can achieve in this month, this month of transformation, this month of uh, connecting with the Quran, this month of uh, sadaqah, this month of qiyam, this month of so many different a'mal. And, and as I said, when we look at these different stories that I'm narrating, the point is what? Is that we should take inspiration to try to achieve what they achieve by yani, dedicating ourselves to these different um, opportunities to do good, inshallah. Wa akhiru da'wana alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen.